but into this charlotte with rodrigo it's just going to be so excited about that so when you know you you laid out the data right and you you kind of talked about angel investing and how much the you know what percent i think was 2.3 percent are hispanic right and then you also look at just wealth creation and, and and the space it's just it's it's amazing in what it's done and how little we're participating in it right so what what we did roughly a year ago um and i believe it was divine and how different national leaders came together and basically with with expertise and interest in this area uh and basically said hey we're seeing this you know we should do something about this and you know and me personally and the leaders who really got together uh, to found this really we're not people that admire problems we're people that actually go after and, and get things done so we spent the back half of 2019 piloting right because to, to pull off an angel group they're not easy it's not an easy to do and we're still in the journey but you need th four three or four things right you need angels to come you know you need angels right that are going to come invest the time invest in companies right you need them to show up to these events you need a you need startups right the second area you need good quality startups right once they're there the angels need to cut checks right because you can you can have great startups lots of angels and nobody's cutting a check you're not you're not going to get this thing going and then you need an operational and a governance infrastructure right and, and those three things you know three or four things need to come together to be successful so we spent the back half of 2019 piloting we did two pitch nights and you saw some of the portfolio companies that we've built and at the beginning of the year we said hey we, we had two successful pilots in a very agile way and we said okay it's you know january 2019 we the, all of the, the kind of this initial core group national group of leaders and venture capitalists and and exec technology executives finance banking executives from all, all across some are on our board some on our advisory board we said, are we, really, are we going to do this? Because it's going to require a lot of work. And everybody said, yes, we're doing this. We're in. And it's been a, it's been a rocket ship. You know, we, we thought we'd be at about, you know, 50 members by the end of this year. We're, we're approaching 50 right now. We had a, a phenomenal Q1 uh, uh, pitch night. We, we cut about $100,000 uh, for, for P-value. We had a good virtual pitch night. We invested in ag tools. And we keep building this this momentum, and we're very excited about about Q3 uh, and, and the partnership that we're going to have with with Estiempo. Um, and you know, we, we've got it. We got an amazing group, you know, of 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 national leaders and a strong network that are helping to find great companies, fund great companies, and help them grow. Right. And and to me, that everybody who all this this phenomenal national network that we have of members are committed to that and it's like it's not only that value and fun that we have but this is a phenomenal network that's national and from a professional development perspective is amazing so that's the brief story of angeles we're starting this journey and we're at the very beginning of it and over the next several years it's going to be an exciting run as we as we uh, drive and, and move out to the, towards that vision so that's that's Angeles, and we'd love you to be a part of the journey for those who are, are, are listening. Now, it's my honor to kind of get, in, get into this charla um, with, with uh, Rodrigo. And uh, Rodrigo, how are you doing, man? I am doing well, man. Thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be here, be not only before uh, you, but a distinguished uh, number of panelists, not panelists, attendees that are joining us here today. So hopefully we do them justice. Oh, that's the plan. That's the plan. So, you know, you... I think it's important, right, that people, you know, you, great, you've been doing angel investing for a while. You have an amazing career journey, a journey that has some components of service, some components of banking, finance, uh, and, and you've seen a lot. Can you just walk everyone through your journey and how it gets you to this, to, to be an angel investor? Sure. Uh, so a good afternoon, everyone uh, who are joining us here live, but also those of you who may be seeing this uh, in a recording later. It's a pleasure to be with everyone here uh, this afternoon slash early evening. So I was born here, uh, south side of Chicago, uh, in Little Village, for those of you uh, who may be familiar with the uh, great city of Chicago, but it's a rough and tumble neighborhood. You know, my parents immigrated here from Mexico in the 1970s. And so I say that because that really helped build the foundation of who I am as an individual. 
you know, I truly believe in be, uh, being able to build wealth uh, and maximizing profits, uh, not only for myself, uh, but for many in our community who we call, uh, you know, hermanos y hermanas, you know, because ultimately uh, my journey from the, uh, took across a number of different t- twists and turns, including, you know, stints in the military uh, in the United States Marine Corps, uh, which led me both to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you know, several years ago, but also uh, have, you know, led me to the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, to Morgan Stanley, uh, to the Illinois State Treasury. I've done some service in there. I've been a, a cabinet member for uh, one of the former governors. Uh, and so it's, it really has uh, been a, you know, a number of different experiences. And, you know, I, I caveat that with, you know, I have also have been involved in a number of different other public service initiatives, including, um, you know, helping, you know, uh, advance certain initiatives and certain services that advance, the, you know, the Latino uh, and Latina uh, kind of perspective, but also, and then overlaying that, you know, I, I teach, uh, today I teach at Northwestern, I'm involved in various uh, uh, components with the Milken Institute and the Aspen Institute as well. Obviously, I'm involved here with Angeles and, you know, I, any way that I can try to advance uh, the, the Latino and Latina perspective in any way that we can, whether it's through building wealth, access to capital, or just economic equity and mobility, those are the things that tend to drive me. And, and because I came, you know, essentially from nothing, uh, you know, for me, anything that's, anything that's north of nothing, it's always going to be uh, something that I'm going to strive for, either for myself or for those uh, that I see out in, the, in communities, not just the Latino community, African-American community, the Asian community, any other who are underrepresented out there. That's a little bit about me and my journey. Yeah, no, it's it's a great journey, right? And thank you for your service to the military. That, that's that's great. Really appreciate that. And, you know, you see this kind of career trajectory growth, but also kind of service, right? Service throughout, right? Kind, kind of lays a good foundation for, for angel investing. Um, but, and by the way, what are you teaching at Northwestern? Just, I'm curious. Yeah, I'm teaching fi- uh, public finance at the moment. It's great. And Northwestern, phenomenal, phenomenal school there. Um mm-hmm. So, you, you know, we look at, you know, investing, investing and wealth building. Um, and, you know, you look at our, you know, you, you've got that and you have our community, right? Which, you know, when you look at our maturity in these areas, we, we have we have a ways to go. Can you like kind of both sides, like, you know, just kind of your thoughts on, you know, our community and investing in wealth building and then talk about like all the you know, the various asset classes that people can invest in and then, you know, maybe, you know, use that to frame up uh, angel investing um, it would be great, Rodrigo. Yeah, most definitely. So, so I'm going to uh, give you both aspects. So in terms of, uh, you know, what do I do every day uh, to, just to give you a little bit of context? So I yeah. am the, I'm the deputy treasurer for the state of Illinois. Uh, and in that role, I'm also the chief investment officer. And so I have, I have an entire team, that helps me oversee about 32 billion uh, in investments uh, for the state, including a 300 billion banking operation and a $4 billion budget. And so I say that uh, because uh, in, you know, through, those, uh, p- uh, through that lens, it's how I you know, look at you know, uh, investments overall. You know, I'm, I'm a very uh, a typical you know, finance professional or investment professional when we're talking about investments, because when you are building wealth, uh, the intent uh, is to be able to maximize your risk adjusted returns, which means that you should uh, you should have based on your risk tolerance, which we can talk about a bit later, uh, you should be having uh, and investing in a number of different asset classes. And when we say, you know, public equities, it should be in your large cap equities or mid cap uh, equities or small cap equities. When we're talking about public markets, it should also include uh, a, a bond exposure, not only to you know, domestic bonds, but also to international bonds. When we're talking about real estate exposure, uh, in terms of public, uh, publicly traded REITs, it means having a diversified risk adjusted portfolio uh, that adjusts not only your, to, to your risk tolerance, but also to your investment objectives based on what you're trying to build. You're just trying to build wealth uh, for the long term in terms of either retirement or you know, for the next 20, 30 years, then you definitely need to be exposed to a number of different asset classes that are going to behave differently in different economic scenarios and different, uh, with different investment strategies. And so, and that means you should be in, in whether it's in value, whether it's in growth, 
uh, whether it's in factor investing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things about investments, uh, at, you know, just in general, is that uh, you need to understand what your risk uh, uh, objective is and what your risk tolerance uh, is. So it's two different things. There's your risk tolerance and your risk profile, and then also what your investment objective. And then from there, you build a great portfolio that is diversified and can withstand a number of economic uh, scenarios. Now with that, uh, uh, one of those things uh, is you should, uh, one of the ways or key ways, at least in my opinion, how you can also continue to diversify is uh, to invest in startups. Um, you know, in this case, uh, you're looking at private markets. Within private markets, you have, you know, different types of investments that you can make all the way from at the at the high end buyout and, and usually what's known as uh, you know, private equity uh, to middle market private equity to, uh, you know, later stage VC, usually series C, series D, all the way down to what's known as angel investing, which is typically in pre-seed and seed and sometimes in series A rounds. And for me, uh, angel investing and or venture capital investing are ways that you can continue to diversify asset classes as you can as you can as you strive to build uh, wealth uh, and or whatever the investment objective may be for you as an angel investor now what is an angel investor and and i, I say this uh, before i say uh, i kind of lay out a little bit of what at least what an angel investment is for me is you know within the 32 billion that we have at, at the you know at the treasury we do have a $1 billion uh, evergreen uh, venture capital and growth equity fund. And so we use that fund to invest in venture capital and private equity, and in sometimes in co directly into co-investments uh, alongside some of our managers. And you know we have funded a number of Latino and Latina um, uh, venture capitalists, as well as a number of portfolios. You know, we're not the type of investor that, you know, does not, that shies away from some of that risk because we've seen the lack and the dearth of Latino and Latina representation uh, within the industry, not only in, in venture capital and angel investment, but also in portfolio companies themselves. And so uh, we have, I, I say that because some of those, uh, what I'm about to, uh, you know, discuss here is also gleaned from many, not only from the conversations that I've had with many GPs and, uh, and, and fellow LPs, but also with startups and with many other stakeholders in the industry as we try to make a difference, not only through on investors, but at least in my case, in my day-to-day -day role, uh, to try to find and invest in some of the most promising GPs out there. And we have uh, helped launch and seed and anchor uh, many diverse uh, founders, and we have many in the pipeline that hopefully will be announcing here uh, in the near future as we continue to try to change that. So with that, uh, an angel investor uh, is someone who invests in a new or small business venture, providing capital for startup or expansion, and usually in exchange uh, for ownership stake, or at least future ownership stake, if not current ownership stake. And angel investors typically fill in that gap between, you know, usually uh, the financing that is provided by the founder him, uh, by himself or herself, uh, but also by their friends and family, and on the other side, venture capitalists. So usually they tend to be a gap uh, uh, and provide gap financing in that space. And, and usually uh, angel investors are also accredited investors who either have a net worth uh, of at least a million dollars or have an annual income of 200000 per year to be in line with the SEC's uh, definition of an accredited investor. Yeah, and that and that's where you know where, where Angelis right comes in is at, at this this angel you know this angel phase where you know if you look at the there's also data on the amount of startups that are out there that have that are Hispanic co-founder and founder right and it, that's still very small you know and and we're growing that right but part of the reason why it's small is the funding right that a lot of them are getting to grow and whatnot right so being able to you know provide that bridge right and 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 Rodrigo kudos to you for what you're doing in, in with the state, right? I, I think it's, you know, think about it, right? South side of Chicago to now 30 billion or 32 billion that, that you know, you're able to invest. It's just a, it's an amazing story in the amount of the growth, right? But the amount of impact, um, you know, that, that you have there. Uh, and, and then and it's just beginning, right? In terms of what, what you're, the, 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 um, the VCs, right? For example, Chingona what, and what she's doing and the, 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 you know, the companies that are getting invested in and what, what the ripple effect downstream to our communities right and you, you you talked about really the diversified portfolio and all the different asset classes right and i think 
as our, you know, as a community, right? I mean, I don't, it, I don't know if your family had conversations about asset classes growing up around the dinner dinner table, you know, large cap, small cap. I'll tell you, we we weren't having conversations like that, right? But you know, you look at how wealth has been created in this in the country, right? It, you know, it, it is it is, let alone you know passing on wealth from one generation to the other. So, it, 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 you know, I, I like the way you frame that up there, but it, it gives a, you know, perspective from, from our, you know, our community and what we need to do to mature there. I don't know anything you want to add on that as we, before we jump deeper into to angel, into the angel space. Yeah, well, I'll use it as a caveat uh, to talk about, you know, the angel investment space. You know, usually people ask me, you know, why did, you know, why are you doing the angel investment? And it goes back and ties into this previous conversation, which is, well, first is obviously to make money. Uh, my intent is not necessarily to write checks, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to be a charitable organization. Yeah. I do that. I, and I fund many uh, great organizations that I, that I believe in their mission, but in terms of angel investment, I do it uh, in order to make money. And so, and in my case, uh, uh, when I came home uh, the first time from uh, Afghanistan back in 2002, uh, I, you know, I wasn't able to go out. You know, I was in, in Kandahar, uh, Afghanistan, so it wasn't like I was at, uh, you know, as I was getting paid every first and fifteenth of the month. It's not like I was going, being able to go out shopping and be able to go out to restaurants or to the nightclub or anything like that. I was saving my money every month. And so when I came home after um, a number of uh, months, I came home with a nice chunk of money. And so what did I do? I, I put it, you know, the most boring thing that I could have done. I put it into an investment account. I started investing at a very young age. And so over time, as I uh, began to build wealth and every time I went overseas and I came home, I would kept uh, building this and as well as, and even then, even when I was in college uh, and in grad school and at every other point, I continued to invest. And I say that because at some point I began to build uh, you know, a, a good amount of wealth. And then from there, I then began to expand into real estate. Uh, and, and then I started buying up a number of properties. And then from there, I was like, okay, how do I continue to diversify? So then I started investing uh, and established uh, uh, private companies, and then I started uh, investing in startups. So for me, it's not only about it's about making money, but it's also a, was about portfolio diversification and ensuring that I didn't have all my eggs in one basket, and instead uh, was able to build wealth uh, not only uh, using the public markets, but also using uh, the private markets. In this case, whether it was real estate holdings or investing a number of you know startups that I felt uh, could make money for me in the long term. And then the second thing, which I think you alluded to this as uh, as well, is that you know many people, uh, you know, when they ask me, you know, why are you investing in underrepresented uh, founders or VCs all the time? You know, are, are you on this? You know, we believe in your social cause, and I, you, you know, I, even though I believe uh, or I appreciate that they're uh, that they are recognizing that uh, I don't do it for a social cause. I truly believe that by that diversity and inclusion uh, is a money maker. By having a, a diverse set of skills, by having a diverse set of perspectives, uh, will ultimately lead to an optimal bottom line. And so, the, for me, the value proposition in this case with uh, with Ankeles, you know, Latinos and Latinos are the fastest growing segment of the population in the United States. If you if just take a look at uh, at the, the population figures for those under the age of 18, and so so for me, uh, it's about investing in at least with Ankeles. It's investing in, in portfolio companies that are have the potential to either have a diverse set of skills or a diverse set of products and services that are catering to the Latino community, especially how fast it's growing. And so, and, and I'll say this other thing. I also believe that, um, that Latinos uh, and Latinas, as well as the people of color with this, whether it's black founders, brown founders, or otherwise, you know, they're hidden gems. You know, not all founders are investable. I'll tell you that, uh, they're not investable. And the best, though, that are out there, they're being funded by venture capitalists. Uh, uh, they get to them first. But I also have seen many venture capitalists uh, that are not investing in people of color, whether intentionally or not intentionally. I would hope not intentionally. And I've also seen um, many venture capitalists themselves are not people of color. And so uh, if we don't have the venture capitalists that are people of color, and we're not, we're not seeing many uh, founders being uh, people of color, this creates an immense opportunity to find those hidden gems uh, and be able to make money and diversify across a number of asset classes as you strive to build wealth. Now, with that being said, I should also say 
that there are also other reasons why uh, uh, angels tend to invest. And uh, those are my two primary ones, but I'm not ignorant to the fact that there are others. And some of these are, are, are also help influence my own investment style. And that includes, uh, you know, connecting with other like-minded individuals, in this case, with other like-minded uh, Latino leaders or, or just uh, like-minded individuals. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a Latino. Um, also to support uh, Latino startups and the broader Latino community. And, and then not necessarily for me, but I know others also come in to learn the art and the science, which is both uh, what it takes to be an angel investor, as they also strive to fulfill some of their own uh, objectives as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, a great, it's a great space when you look at, you know, the angel, this angel space. We're going to kind of, you know, d- dig a little bit in there, right? And the, the great thing about Angelis, right, when you look at, we got a phenomenal, we have a rock star, we have a rock star board, we have a rock star advisory board, and we have a rock star team, the operations team. And what they're doing on a, on a quarterly basis is looking at scouring the country and finding what are the best Hispanic and Latinx early stage companies, right? And filtering them down to the best, what we believe are the best three, right? To, to invest in three or four, four to invest in and giving our members a view of those on a, on a, on a quarterly basis, which I think is, it's great, right? So, so as, a, as a member, you don't have to do that yourself. You have a team that's doing that for you. What do you, I mean, and, I, and this is an exciting space, right? Because you can leverage your, you know, you, you know your, your innovation muscles and learning, right? Learning about all these different business models, these disruption and all that stuff. Um, but also, you know, a lot of us are very connected, right? And, and it's an advantage that our community has that we can really help, you know, m- help these companies make some connections and help them grow. What, Rodrigo, when you look at that that backdrop and you look at an angel investor, right? What what is a what makes up a good angel investor? You know, how do you go? What's your approach to going about doing it? Get, share some thoughts there. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so for me, uh, a few things because uh, uh, this is where you know what differentiates you uh, when you start making you know and writing checks and whether you're going to make money off of this. And so it's a very key and important question. So. You know, I'll give you the first the highlights and then I'll go in a little bit more into detail. So the first thing is I'm going to be looking at is then the investment thesis of the company. You know, is it a disruptive business model? Is it business, is it business to business, business, uh, you know, B2B, B2B, B2C, B2B, B2B, et cetera, et cetera. So does the investment thesis make sense for the company? And as well as what is the opportunity? What is the target market? What exactly is it, uh, is the potential here for this company to leverage uh, that thesis into a discernible and really impactful uh, number? And then also uh, customer, what is the customer acquisition channels and the revenue growth? You know, ultimately it's great uh, that if a company is able to grow, but at the end of the day, in order to make money, you need revenue and, and cash flow. And so ultimately what is the customer acquisition channels and revenue growth either in the present or in its future, as well as what is the entrepreneur's level of really maturity is what it, what it comes down to. Do they have the necessary skill set? Uh, whether on the leadership side or on the technical side to really help grow that company. Now, from there, if one of those or a combination of those uh, uh, give me that, you know, additional willingness to have a conversation uh, with a company, then from there you do a really in-depth due diligence process. Uh, You know, what is the, the, the revenue traction, the growth rates, the penetration rates, you know, does uh, uh, what is the pre-money valuation, the post-money valuation that they're seeking in terms of assuming that they're uh, fundraising? Uh, what does the management look like? It, you know, I've kind of alluded to this a, a bit. Do they have a, you know, what's the, the strategic plan? What is the, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be written out, but I would want to understand that they have, a, have had detailed thoughts about, uh, you know, the strategy for the company, their leadership ability, their previous experience, especially at, at other startups. What's the, pro- the viability of the product or the service? You know, what are the established uh, customer relationships that, that they have or do they have none? What's the ability for them to create? Do they have a sales team uh, to be able to do that? What's the economic moat of the company? You know, what is, do they, is it a, uh, do they have a patent? Do they have any type of defensible IP? What are the barriers to entry? Can someone come in uh, that may have, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a better financial uh, footing and try to, you know, muscle them out of the space? Uh, what's the financial health of the company? You know, what, what capital has been raised? What's the, the strength of their balance sheet? How much cash do they have on hand, if any? What's the, do they have revenue? And if it is, how, what's the recurring revenue? As well as any run rate, you know, what are the expenditures? Are you going to be buying a check? Uh, what's the expenditures that they are, uh, that they're running on a monthly or annual basis? 
And on that note, what is the purpose of the of the capital that they're seeking from you? Uh, so is it you know is it for sales acquisition, for talent acquisition, for, is it to improve the product? You know what ultimately are they going to use the, uh, the investment of capital? And does it make sense uh, in terms of what they're planning to invest it in in order to be able to grow and scale the company? Uh, as well as you know what is uh, what's the cap table look like? Uh, is it something very simple or is it very messy? Is it one, two, or is it uh, three uh, co-founders? Is it ten? You know, I've seen all kinds of different things when it comes to the cap table. So we, you would want to know what's the equity that has been raised to date, how much, uh, how is that uh, equity vested in the members of management and the members of the team, as well as many others who have invested before you, uh, as, and who they are, because that is also key. Because some of these individuals, depending on the level of equity, uh, may also have you know vested interest that may or may not be in alignment with yours. Uh, what are the capital requirements of the company? If it's going to grow to the degree that it needs to grow at, in order to get to, you know, an, a, a viable exit, what does that capitalization look like? And you're going to see all kinds of different needs based on whether it's a hardware play, a software play, and any, you know, whether it's a, and, and, you know, pharma, whether it's in consumer tech, et cetera, et cetera. And then a few other things that I'll just mention is obviously I mentioned already the valuation of the firm is key especially as you're looking as an angel investor, uh, you tend to be in either the pre, the pre C seed or series A, you definitely want to know what the valuation is. You know, at the end of the day, most angels go in with an intent, uh, you know, where it's most risky and they usually go uh, ask and request for a low valuation and with an intention of going and getting a high valuation. You know, the intent here is not to go for a high valuation and, and hopefully then uh, reach an even higher valuation down the road. And so ultimately valuation is key exit strategy, what's ultimately the desired liquidity event, deal structure as well, you know, is this coming in preferred equity, common equity, is it, is it a debt, is it a convertible debt, is it a safe note, is there, you know, what are the, the up, um, any type of uh, qualifying rounds or non-qualifying rounds that may occur, you know, rates and discounts as well, triggers, all that stuff around deal structure. And then the, you know, portfolio construction, you know, as, a, as an angel investor, you want to be diversified across a number of different sectors and industries uh, and different companies, uh, you know, whether it's based on revenue, based on industries and sectors, whether it's based on the growth stage, you know, you ultimately you want to be able to spread the risk. Um, you know, angel investing is about false positives versus false negatives. You know, usually uh, one or two por uh, portfolio companies, depending on how many you have, are going to be your drivers. And then you're going to have another hand. Usually you have about a, a third, but within that third, usually one, uh, one or two are going to be the drivers. But usually one third will make money. One third will be about the you'll make you'll make out about even and then about a third you may lose money. And so and so you definitely want to be in uh, in a number of companies to ensure that you spread not only your risk, but you also uh, increase the likelihood that you have uh, an ability to be in one of these one or two portfolio companies that are going to return 20 or 30 times X. Um, and whereas, a, you know, a good number is going to do, you know, one to two X. And, and so ultimately, you have to gain that out for your portfolio construction. And then lastly, uh, what I would just say is talk to people at the end of the day, talk to the members of management and the staff for that company. Obviously, I would hope that, uh, that they are pitching you, pre uh, presumably talk to their advisors. Uh, talk to their investors uh, uh, who have come in before or are potentially coming in into the round. Talk to their customers. Uh, see what their experience has been with the company. Um, uh, talk to their competitors uh, to be, uh, be able to understand. Obviously, you have to be a, a bit careful to ensure that you're not provide uh, that if you are under an NDA that you're not providing any undue uh, information. But you can talk to people to really learn about that company and that company space. And then at the end of the day, just rely on others. In this case, you know, we have uh, the Angeles uh, due, due diligence staff that does a lot of this work for Angeles investors, or you rely on other Angeles that are uh, doing due diligence on the company uh, and ask them about their own thoughts and their own analysis. Uh, and I've seen both, um, both uh, uh, individuals who rely on Angeles staff and others who rely on Angeles uh, investors who know the space and who know the background uh, and, and can help other Angeles uh, think about, you know, a, a particular opportunity with a particular lens, you know, and as a, you know, bottom line pro tip, at the end of the day, invest in what you know, avoid the herd mentality, uh, and, and, the, and at least in, in my opinion, that's how you become a successful or at least a good angel investor by doing your proper due diligence and, on, and investing in what you know. Yeah, there's there's a lot there's a lot of great insights, right? You shared there and how you really look at a company and invest, and it's really about kind of you know de-risking, right? I mean, you know, you build a portfolio. These are high higher risk 
but higher return, right? And if you build a nice portfolio, I think the average angel portfolio of a well-built portfolio that with an angel group, you do, do, do the due diligence, you're looking at about 20% IRR and we can have our team send out to members and who are watching this, that, that exact number, but it's roughly in there of a well-built portfolio. Some are do very well, some are going to die, right? So if you, you know, this is a little bit, you know, you have to be willing to say, I'm going to invest in 10, 20, some are going to go do well, some are going to, some are going to die. Um, and you know, the other interesting thing that I think that triggered some thoughts when you were talking, right, is a lot of our members um, are, are, are new to this space. So, and, and, and you know what? I was seven years ago. I assume you were. So these terms like moat and CAC and LTV and MRR and all this kind of, you know, terminology, you know, we, we've had to learn them over time. And some of our members are beginning this journey but they're learning more, you know, you start educating your, ourselves more about all these different terminologies and a lot of the, the, the you know, things that you mentioned that I think people preferred equity and cap tables and all this stuff. It, it's, it's, it shouldn't be overwhelming. I didn't know much of it when I, when I started and I just little by little, I started learning, learning, learning. And I, I, Rodrigo, I'd, I'd assume, you know, I don't want to speak for you, but <laughs> like your thoughts, like you've kind of learned along the way. And I think that's an exciting part of the journey. Would you agree, or what are your thoughts there? Before we jump into Q and A, because I know we're we're running we're running on time. Yeah, most definitely, I 100% agree. Uh, at the end of the day, I have relied on others, uh, just like others have relied on me. And uh, I, every time that I'm in a in a type of uh, business deal, I'm always learning from others, learning from uh, other fellow investors. But even in the in the daytime role, uh, for any number of us uh, who are out there. Uh, who, uh, who are not angel investors, who are professional angel, angel investors in terms of that's what they do for their full-time role. You know, we learn uh, any number of things that we can apply as we're evaluating uh, companies. And so I 100% agree. And look, I am risk tolerant. You know, I can take the impact of potential losses. That doesn't mean that I'm purposely seeking risk for the thrill. I invest for the long term. You know, I'm in my mid-30s, so I have the ability to write out uh, volatility uh, and also replenish, uh, you know, my own earnings quite easily since, I'm, you know, I'm in my prime earning years. So ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to figure out what your risk profile is and know that, that yes, you are investing and the likelihood you may be some, but if you write it out for the long term and you invest uh, with proper due diligence and uh, you uh, rely on either Angel's staff or investors, you minimize, uh, you know, some of the volatility and some of that risk. So I 100% agree. And look, you can help a founder in a number of different ways. You can help them with money you, uh, or, uh, and or I should say, uh, you can help them with your own time or with resources and connections, which was alluded to earlier. So there's many ways you can bring value to the table. It just be, uh, means based on your own uh, personal uh, abilities and capabilities. And so there's a number of ways you can support uh, portfolio companies uh, through Ancales and otherwise. Yeah, no, that's great, great uh, insights there. I'm, I'm kind of scrolling through some of the the uh, the chats here, and just you know, there's some familiar faces and and or, or names and and uh, a couple new ones, right? So, so the familiar ones is great to see you on. To the new ones, we'd love to get you a part of of what we're doing here. You know, so a couple questions are off. A couple of you know, Semper Fi's. You know, shout outs to you, uh, uh, Rodrigo, which is great. Uh, a little bit about check size, right? So a couple of questions flying around about check size. You want to share some thoughts just on your your thoughts on check size, what that means, your range, most industry definitely. range. Yeah, most definitely. And Semper Fi uh, for those folks uh, who. Uh, who have served in the United States Marine Corps, and even if you haven't served in uniform, or, uh, we, we uh, nonetheless we serve you. Uh, so average check size. So for, I'll first give you my own uh, personal experience. So the smallest check size I've ever written is five thousand dollars. The largest is fifty thousand dollars that I've written. Now that is just me, and I'm op I'm a pretty open and transparent book, so I don't mind necessarily sharing that. Uh, but in you know in accordance with our principles. Uh, at, at Ancalis, you know, usually we expect, well, we, don't, we don't require, we just expect that members, uh, you know, uh, to the degree that they feel comfortable, invest approximately 15000 a year in whatever increments uh, that they feel most comfortable uh, uh, with. But with that being said, and as I alluded to, it's not required to invest that level if you don't feel comfortable and you're not required to disclose your level of investment in GUST, which is our investment platform. Uh, at the end of the day, at Ancalis, you know, we value the privacy of our angels, 
And so while uh, for me, my check size is, as you can see, it's very wide from, uh, from five to 50, uh, for, you know, for the average angel I've seen, you know, uh, I think uh, from some of the, the studies that I've seen, most angel investments on a given year tend to range somewhere between 10 and 20,000, depending on which study and kind of the, uh, the way that uh, you measure it. But it's, so it could be very doable. And for us, uh, we've lowered that to as low as 5,000 because we know that as a community, uh, building wealth, uh, we're still uh, building wealth. We're tech, you know, depending on what part of the country we're, we tend to be pretty new to this country and building wealth and others have had a number of other institutional uh, barriers to building wealth. So we've tried to make it a uh, structure in a way where uh, members not only can uh, rely on others to help uh, build their investment acumen, but also doing it in a way that makes it feasible for Ankeles to invest a, a monetary value that is not disclosed uh, that, that is comfortable with their own risk tolerance and with their own, you know, investment objectives. Excellent. And uh, there's a couple other questions here around books and reading and what, you know, if somebody wants to educate themselves in the space, what are some books you've read and, and um, blogs maybe or email things that you can give to our members? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you are uh, trying to get some insights on, you know, say, companies and startups, maybe to uh, get a better understanding of how many startups today are being structured, probably uh, uh, the Lean Startup uh, is a great one because most startups today are you know, launching under that model. At least, uh, at least across many of the portfolio companies that uh, I've come across. And so you probably want to become familiar uh, with uh, some of those insights and perspectives. Now, if you're looking more as to how to be, better become an angel investor overall, you know, there, a lot of that is going to uh, depend on a number of issues. But instead of saying a, a book or I'm going to go ahead and give you some organizational uh, entities uh, that we at Anclis have, uh, have uh, promoted and have uh, uh, alluded to in some of our uh, previous um, uh, literature. One is uh, to obviously, the, the, if you are a member of, um, of uh, Anculus, you have access to the ACA, which is the, uh, they're the, the trade association for angel investors, as well as the angel capital association. Uh, they have a tremendous amount of resources, including uh, how to properly uh, vet and due diligence on a number of different companies, you know, how to look at different, you know, sector specific issues, whether it's blockchain, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's cannabis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's uh, a great, now say you, uh, for, uh, you're still contemplating uh, becoming uh, a member of Ankylis, you're maybe not necessarily a member yet, you're looking for some other resources. There are some other great resources, say, and one of the ones that I would uh, point out, just because they do have a lot of great, uh, easy, uh, straightforward, and I, and I do follow them, uh, is uh, Republic, uh, which is a big crowdsourcing uh, platform. They have a lot of great uh, videos as well. And Ankeles also uh, uh, tends to have a good number of par uh, partnerships with them. Now, if you're looking to get, okay, maybe that's some good entry level. Now you want to get a little bit more into maybe some of the mid-level components. Uh, I would obviously uh, give you the, um, the A16 blog, which is uh, Anderson Horowitz's uh, website. They have a great blog that gives you a lot of great indicate, uh, a lot of great, um, you know, insights and and background into how they uh, view, um, you know, venture capital overall. But uh, within that, what I like about them is some of their insights in terms of what are some of the trends that are happening in the marketplace. So those are just a little bit of a, a background across a number of different pieces. I've read some angel investment books across the way, but nothing that I would want to mention that has blown me away yet. But, you know, if I ever uh, do come across uh, some of those, I'll make sure to uh, uh, mention those or ask the, uh, or uh, suggest those in any future, you know, uh, webinar that I may do, uh, whether with Ankylis or otherwise. So, yeah, that's kind of some, just some quick thoughts on that. Yeah, there's a, there's a good book. Um, I think it's, it's called, it's, it's something, and somebody maybe can Google this, right? But it's like Angel Investing, How I Took a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars and made ten million by Jason Calcanis, I think is his name. He's a he's a very he's a very famous angel investor. I've read it. It's a really really good book that and it and it talks about a lot of the you know great comments that, that uh, you shared here, uh, Rodrigo. I'll just I, I think I put it in the the, the chat window there. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a good question. Um, if I have three hundred thousand for angel investments, how do I how do I start investing? 
That's a, that's a great question. So the first thing you have to uh, ask yourself is, uh, what is your what is your investment objective? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, and and that goes from both a time perspective, but also from uh, a, a you know a wealth accumulation. Well, I shouldn't say wealth accumulation. From a perspective, is it just to build wealth? Is it to diversify? Is it to ensure that you have a nest egg down the road? Is it to invest in and help diversify? You know, access to capital for Latino startups. You know, you have to ask yourself, what is your investment objective? Then you, the second question you have to ask yourself is, what is your risk tolerance? Um, do you want to, um, you know, are you risk averse? Are you not risk averse? Are you kind of somewhere in the middle? Uh, because that's going to help you uh, decide what your portfolio construction is going to be. And then the third component that you have to ask uh, yourself is, are you going to be involved or, may, or do you want to be involved in some of these? And, and again, I preface that with some portfolio companies uh, have different uh, views as, as to whether investors uh, should or should not be involved. But the, the third question is, do you want to be involved? Do you think you can add value to those portfolio companies with your access to connections, resources, and time? And I say that because if the, your intent is not to do that, then I would say you, to the degree that you feel is optimal, uh, and there's, and a lot of that is also driven by all the components that I uh, that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier. But if you are not going to be involved, then you should try to spread in order to have uh, investments in a number of different companies. So probably you want to go with a high number of investments. What number that is, whether it's you know five uh, sixty thousand dollar investments, or if you want to do twenty, uh, what would that be? Twenty, you know, fifteen thousand dollar investments. Uh, it's going to be, or even higher, right? If you want to do, say, five thousand dollars a piece, you could definitely can then do, uh, in this case, sixty different investments, uh, and that is going to be influenced about the number of time, the, how much time and resources and connections. Because what I've seen is investors who are more hands-on and they tend to write bigger checks. Uh, then obviously you can do uh, probably a higher check size because you're going to be involved in hopefully building that value. If your intent is not to do that, then I would say write smaller checks. And the, and if you have high confidence in some uh, startups, then you would write, instead of doing 5,000, you would write 20,000. If you have lower uh, confidence, you write 10,000. So you, so you begin to build your portfolio uh, uh, as such, and you don't have to build your portfolio in one year. You uh, Obviously, if you have 300,000 a year, A, I, I commend you, I wanted to do this. Uh, and to further, uh, you know, the cost. But if it's 300000 over time, then you definitely want to also diversify uh, in a number of companies. Uh, you know, we call it by vintage year. So like that, you have a, a exposure to a number of different companies who are at different points in their growth uh, tra uh, trajectory. And so like that, uh, over time, say five years, seven years down the road, you have very, uh, much more mature companies that you're invested in as you're also investing on the, on the early side of companies as well. So hopefully the, the name of the game at the end of the day is diversification uh, across a number of different factors and variables. And that is going to be ultimately be influenced by your objective, your tolerance, and what your ultimate uh, goal is uh, and in terms of being involved with these companies are. Yeah, that's, it's a, that's a great, I think that's spot on, right? And in, in the book Angel, they talk a little bit about that, about, you know, sprinkling them. But he also in the book of Angel, he talks about this, this next question, which is a great, I think it's a great question. And it was some, it was some learning for me. Um, and I want to get your perspective on it. So do you keep cat, you know, so do you keep cash on hand when the, when the opportunity comes and then follow on and what's your, you know, you, you can sprinkle it on, but what, how did you, what was your learning as it related to follow on rounds and when do you do follow on and what is a follow on strategy? And, you know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question actually. So the, so for many of you who, who may or may not be familiar with this, so usually when you invest in a company, you're investing alongside a number of other investors and whatever round it may be and whatever stage that the company may be. Uh, at that point, the company takes uh, the investment capital, they invested uh, uh, per you know the, their, their strategic plan. And then at some point in the future though, uh, they may need uh, additional access uh, to capital. Uh, to continue the growth trajectory, to continue, uh, you know, uh, sales acquisitions and, and marketing and et cetera, et cetera. And so that's when the follow on rounds are. Uh, and that's where you see the pre seed, the seed, the series A, the series B. Now, uh, two things that you have to think about. Uh, the first is, are you going to invest in those follow on investment rounds? 
obviously the, the, the first key is, do you continue to have confidence in the strategy of that company and its uh, growth tra trajectory? Presumably, if it's continued to fundraise, it's going gangbusters, well, presumably it's going gangbusters, but that is not necessarily always the case, uh, especially for the, uh, if you're an angel investor and, and tend to have maybe a, a, a bit better insight uh, on where the company is going, and, and you may have your own, uh, in, uh, not only intuition, but your own opinion as to where that company is. So the first is, where do, you know, how confident are you in that company in order to invest uh, in that uh, company's subsequent rounds, uh, whether it's uh, moving from a pre-C to a C, to a C to an A, an A to a B, B to a C. And then the second piece is, if it is definitely going uh, and growing to the degree that you feel confident, is you also want to avoid dilution because any time that uh, additional investors come on board, uh, your equity stake in that company may be diluted. And so you ultimately, and, and that's also going to be based on the deal terms that are uh, that you're agreeing to when you do your first initial investment. But you also want to be in, uh, ensure that if you are with a company that is growing, that you're not being diluted and that you have, and you continue to do follow on investment. So uh, ultimately when you, uh, this company reaches uh, uh, some type of liquidity event, that not only do you take advantage of your early uh, investment, but any of the subsequent investment rounds. What does that mean? That means that you need to have cash on hand. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you're not going to usually get a call and say, okay, we're going to close tomorrow. We need your cash. So it's not like you, you necessarily need to have that amount of cash and it's necessarily say in a savings account, but you do need to have access within, uh, say within um, 30 to 60 days. Uh, so when you do uh, uh, or are given word, uh, by you know the portfolio company uh, to its existing base of investors that uh, they're going to do another fundraising round and whether uh, you're willing to participate in it that you then have the available cash on hand uh, to be able to invest. Now myself, as I mentioned earlier, usually I'm uh, uh, my spare cash is, is in the S and P 500 because I don't necessarily need it and uh, uh, and have a pretty easy access to it. Uh, and have an ability to convert it into cash. Um, I do keep uh, other investment, uh, I mean, not investment, other cash around for emergencies, but I, I wouldn't consider that investment cash. My investment cash is usually an S&P 500. And again, I'm a very risk tolerant and I'm looking for the long term. Uh, and, you know, for me, the long term is 30 to 40 years. And so I don't necessarily need that uh, uh, level of, um, of uh, uh, conservative cash, but others may have it in a short term bond fund. It can be in a high yield savings account. It could be in a number of other investment vehicles. But you should think about having follow on investment capital if you think any of your portfolio companies uh, are going gangbusters and you want to continue to ride that uh, wave uh, and not allow others uh, to come on after you. Uh, and dilute your equity and for them to, uh, you know, have uh, the majority, I shouldn't say the majority, but uh, share and access, um, you know, upside. So two things to keep in mind for follow on capital. Yeah. And the way I look at it is that you got like, you know, the portfolio of 10 or 20 or whatever, and you're going to, you know, you're going to get those one or two or, well, yeah, well hopefully we get, you get more, but you're going to have, if, if, you know, portfolio of 10, I, a good portfolio, you'll have three or four rock stars, three or four average and three or four are going to die. But those three or four rock stars, you want to ride those babies all the way, all the way up. Cause you're, as they, as they mature, the risk goes down and you know, the, re the return isn't as high as it was early on, but you're still getting a you know great return. Cause these are, you know, 10, 20, 30 X, but you know, you balance that with those that, you know, that are going to, you know, not do so well in the portfolio. So, um, Rodrigo, thanks. Thanks for sharing. I mean, it's, we covered a lot of great ground, right? I think from your background, which, you know, really phenomenal background, but I would, you know, for, our, for those who are watching, listening, we have a phenomenal group of national leaders that are part of Angeles who have phenomenal accomplishments in various industries, right? And this is, uh, you know, one phenomenal expert that we have here. Um, uh, and then we've got an amazing Q3 coming up here at August 28th, I believe. It's going to be exciting. We got a phenomenal group of companies that we're filtering down. So that's going to be a, it's going to be great. Tune in for that. And uh, with that, I'd like to, I think we turn it over to um, Marisol, who's, you know, when you look at the membership engine and Marisol has really helped, you know, pull that together. And Marisol, it's, uh, you know, thank you for, for all of that and all the work behind the scenes making this, this event happen. So Marisol, we'll take it to you to talk about membership and then close us out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, David. You. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Marisol Reyes, and I am 
the um, the head of memberships at Angeles Investors. I am excited to announce that we had 60% growth in our second quarter of 2020, totaling 40 members up to date. We are capping our founding uh, members group um, up to 50, so we do have some spots left. At Angeles, we are also very avid on gender equality. And so far, 20% of our founding members are women. We would like to increase that number at 50%. Also, um, actually, this was released today. And um, we at Angeles, we are very, very proud of two of our founding members, Adela Cepeda and Yasmin Winkler, for making it or being recognized as the Latina Leaders uh, Magazine's top 100 most influential Latinas. So congratulations to them. To increase our member, our national membership, uh, our members base, uh, we, would, we would encourage you to join us and become a founding member at Angeles Investors. And for that, you must meet the following criteria. Be an accredited investor under the SEC guidelines, invest a minimum of $20,000 per year and actively support the Angeles Investors mission. That means um, follow us on social media. We have a Twitter, we have a LinkedIn. If you're a founding member, please um, add us in your experience on LinkedIn. Attend pre-screening uh, calls and due diligence as well as, as well as our pitch night events. And uh, so we also want to invite you to our upcoming charla which are the following, evaluating a startup pitch on August 13th. And on September 10th, we'll be talking about what are the keys to due diligence. And last but not least, as David mentioned before, if you're interested, if you're an angel investor, you're not necessarily a founding member uh, at Angeles Investors, you can still um, participate in our Q3 pitch night on August 28th. So if you, if you would like to um, attend and more information about that, contact me at members at angelisinvestors.com. Okay, to close, I want to um, say thank you to our host, David Olivencia, and our guest speaker, Rodrigo Garcia, for your continued support and um, in your insights. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank all our attendees for supporting our first charla, and I look forward to seeing all of you on our upcoming events. Thank you so much. Stay safe.